I wanted to, uh, for the, I, I know a few of you here probably, I, I spoke a couple months ago. I'm gonna to be touching on a couple things we talked about a couple months ago, and I just wanted to kind of bring you up to speed as much as we can, and then kind of dig into this topic just a little deeper. Um, but maybe you might recognize this. If you were here a couple months ago, I, I, I presented this idea of the town of Betterville and the town of Bitterville. Does anybody remember this? Okay, vaguely, okay, very good. So, town of Betterville and the town of Bitterville. And the question was, which town would you rather live in? Okay. Now, be careful how you say that, because we're going to talk a little more about that today. But um, also, we did this little thing. Does anybody remember this saying? The worst thing that happens to you may be the best thing for you if you don't let it get the best of you. Okay? And remember we played that really exciting game and nobody could figure out who it was. And so today I'm going to give you a second chance. Okay? This particular phrase was from Will Rogers. All right? But before we get to that, I'd like to just have a brief word of prayer. So if you would bow your heads with me. Lord, we, we look at these two towns and we think of Betterville and Bitterville. And um, it's pretty clear when we compare the two, which one we'd like to live in. And yet, if I'm honest with myself, I realize I live in the Bitterville town way too often. And I imagine there's others here who perhaps are in that same situation. But we, won't, we don't want to live there any longer. We, we want to live in Betterville. And we want your help. We need your help. And I think there's some guidance that uh, you've given us to help us move in that direction and make that our permanent residence. And so I just ask and seek your guidance as we explore this topic today and help open our hearts and minds to maybe some things that are not so clear or maybe are hidden a little from us that um, could possibly make a big difference. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so here we go. We have a small delegation in the far left section, but we're going to need a representative from your from your section. So. Who would like to be the classic representative from your area? Okay, we need one person from your area. Now, here's the thing we're doing. We're playing a game called 20 questions. Okay, 20 questions, and you and, and the clue is I am a person. I mean, I, not me personally. I mean, I'm a person too, but the person we're trying to guess is a person. Does that make sense? We're not guessing an animal. We're not guessing a place. We're not guessing a thing. We're guessing a person. Okay, very good. You know the game, how the 20 questions is played. 20 questions is you can only ask a yes. You can only ask me a question that I can only respond to either yes or no. If you get a yes answer, you get to ask me another question. If you get a no answer, it goes to the next person. You with me? Okay. So I can only answer yes or no. Yeah? You with me? Okay. Who's your representative over here? Dan? Okay, very good. Dan, who will we have in this section? Nancy or Jill? Okay, Jill, very good. Thank you for volunteering, Jill. Okay, who do we have over here? <laughs> okay, Judy, very good. And who do we have from this section? George? Okay, George. Thank you for volunteering, George. All right, George, we'll start with you, okay? You get to ask me uh, a yes or no question. But make sure you say loud enough so people uh, can go. So we're trying to break this down, who this person is. Please, George, go ahead. Man. No, it is not a man. That's a good question, by the way. Okay, Judy? Yes. Now, who's keeping track of the questions? I mean, the number. We need to keep our track because when we hit 20, Greg, will you be our scorekeeper? Okay, that's two questions. I'm not sure if it was a necessary question, but it's a good question. Yes, it is a woman. Yes, she's American.
Did she live during slave times? No, she did not live during slave. I mean, are you talking about slavery here in the United States? Okay, very good. No. Okay, Jill. Is she alive today? No, she is not alive today. That was a good question. Dan? Is she from Texas or Oklahoma? She is not from Texas or Oklahoma. Okay, George? Was she born after 1900? She was not born after 1900. Is she the wife of a president? She is not a wife of a president. Is she an author? I believe she is an author. I, I'll give you another question. I'm pretty, I think she is. It'll probably become clear once you guys find out who she is, and you'll go, oh, yes, okay. But um, I, that's a, I'm not sure. I think she is, but I'm not sure. Go ahead, ask another one. No. Okay. Is she a Christian? Yes. Is she Caucasian? Yes. Is she Caucasian? Was she a Christian and is she Caucasian? Yes and yes. Is she Adventist? No, she was not Adventist. Okay. So I'm going to give you the benefit because Judy asked me if she was alive during slavery. And I think slavery ended officially like in 1860 something. So I will say, I'll, I'll give you another question. So, so she wasn't alive during any, yeah. Does that help? Was she known for her profession? No. No, I mean, you might reckon it, but no, she was not. Judy. Oh, how many? Five left? Five more questions, okay. No, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. Yes, no, she was not really known for her Christian works. I mean, technically her work could have been thought of as Christian, but I don't, I would say no, the way you're probably answering the, asking the question. Okay, Jill. Was she an artist? No, she was not an artist. Is she a teacher? No, she wasn't a teacher. I mean, no, she wasn't a teacher. Okay, how many questions left? Two questions left, George. Don't want to put the pressure on you, but two questions left. Was her husband famous? No. And I'll, I'll give you, I'll even, well, no, she wasn't famous. Okay, this is our last question, Greg. Is this right? This is number 20. No, I don't. I mean, she may have been a poet, but she's not really known for her poetry that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm opening to, um, I'm open to anybody who think they might know who didn't have to, get to ask a question. Anybody? Huh? Pardon? No, no. I'll give you a couple clues. Uh, she was born in 1880. Um, she was never married. <laughs> um, if I give these two clues, you'll guess it right away. Oh, she was born in Alabama. Huh? Who? Helen Keller. 
Helen Keller. She didn't know. She did not know. Helen Keller. So it says she was an author. I don't know if most of us think of her as an author. Teacher. She was a speaker. I guess she could be a teacher. But what do we know about Helen Keller, right? We know that she was blind and deaf. Blind and deaf. Apparently, the way I understand the story was that she received, had a sickness when she was about a year and a half old that caused her blindness and her lack of being able to hear. Interesting, when I was looking through this, some of you might, may know this story, but she had a teacher that really brought her into this whole experience of learning, whose name was Ann Sullivan. And this picture, believe it or not, was only discovered in 2008, well after her death. It was in somebody's scrapbook that they'd kept in their family. And this is apparently the first photo of Helen on the left when she was eight years old with her teacher, Ann Sullivan. This is the very first picture of them together, apparently. And I have a video here, Caleb. Are we gonna be able to do this? I, this is a video that Caleb's gonna play for us that I had never seen this before. And I just wanted to give you a little sight. I think it's about a minute and a half long. We'll see if he can get it queued up for us and we'll watch it together. In this room sits a remarkable woman. She's Miss Helen Keller. She felt the vibration of the spoken word. She feels the G, the hard G. G. On the lips, she feels the uh, B. I, I am, am not, not dumb, dumb now. No. So here's a quote by Helen Keller. A happy life consists not in the absence, but in the mastery of hardships. You know, I've, I've always, I don't know why I think about this, but I've always thought to myself, wow, if I, if I couldn't, if I had to choose whether I couldn't hear or I couldn't see, which one would I want to choose? right? I'd probably like to make sure I could see. But what if you had, you couldn't see or you couldn't hear? I mean, can you even fathom what that would be like? I mean, I, I can't even really map, map, wrap my mind around that. And yet here's this lady who apparently, I think they said that she met 12 presidents during her lifetime, personally met them. And, uh, and I just think about, where do you think Helen lived? You think she lived in Betterville or Bitterville? How is that possible? How is that possible, right? So we think about this, right? Adversity, setbacks, hardships, problems, we all have them. Everybody in this room has them. Some of them are on big scales. I think of Sandy. I think of Sandy's situation. I think like that's a that's a that's a that's a big scale, right? And yet, we all have 
these things that go on in our life. And they happen often. And so today, I'd like to just talk a little bit about which town would you rather live in? And is there something we can do that actually gives us a better opportunity to live in Betterville versus living in Bitterville? Okay? So we're going to dis discuss this a little bit. I don't know if, how many of you have ever heard of this program. Have you ever heard of this program called Unshackled? Okay? Unshackled is a dramatized radio program that highlights different individuals' lives. And they've been doing this. A place called, it's produced by Pacific Garden Missions, missions located in Chicago. And they've been doing these radio drama stories since 1950. They have thousands of these stories, thousands. And you know, I've listened to a variety of them. Uh, you can listen to it on, uh, I believe the radio station here locally is uh, 90.7. It's a religious station. And they have, uh, I don't remember what the timing is of the day, but I think they play one of these stories every day. And sometimes in the car and, you know, they have this organ, they have this little organ theme music that starts off that sounds like 1950. And they still use the organ theme music, the exact same organ theme music that they used back in 1950. But the idea about this program is that it talks about people. And I find that this has been always the case, at least in every story I've heard, that these stories are about people who have big problems, big problems, right? I mean, they're raised in a certain situation, a very bad upbringing. Most of the time they get into drug abuse. Most of the time they have been in prison. Most of the time, you know what I'm saying? Just this, this kind of run of the mill. It's just like these, the stories are pattern after pattern after pattern, different names, different people, different ages, different time frame. But the, the story has a very similar pattern to it. And what happens is that it's about real people, real life stories, stirring dramatic accounts of hopelessness. These people are hopeless. And they find hope that changes everything. So they go from being very bitter to living in a very better place. And they, they do it all, they, they all do it basically by the same way. You know what the same way is? They find hope that changes everything, and that hope is Jesus Christ. Now, that's an easy thing to, to just say like that. And today I want us to kind of look at three keys to help us unshackle ourselves from living in Betterville. Or, or in Bitterville, not Betterville, but Bitterville, right? How can we do this, okay? So here's key one. Key number one, to live in Betterville when adversity strikes. Be grateful for what you do have in life. Okay? Be grateful for what you do have in life. Now, these three keys that we're going to talk about today are not exhaustive. There's probably 20 keys. There may be 30 keys. But as I was looking and doing some preparation for this talk today, I felt like these three really related to me. And I thought, well, if they relate to me, they may relate to some other people too. But this was one aspect. Be grateful for what you do have in life. And there's a, there's a text that kind of goes right along, this with, along with this, and it's found in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. And it says, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Okay, now let's break this dead. So here's the thought. Instead of asking why something happens to you over and over, which makes us feel worse and worse, ask what opportunity is there here for me? What can God do? Now, this could be a small little uh, challenge that you may be facing, a small adversity you may be facing, or this could be an enormous adversity that you're facing. 
okay? The question we want to ask ourselves is, what is the hidden opportunity within this adversity? What is the hidden opportunity? Because here's the thing, if we saw opportunity every time we had adversity, then we might be more to welcoming adversity. Oh, there's, a, there's an opportunity here. But I don't think that's how most of us feel when, it, when adversity strikes, right? We oftentimes ask what? Why me? Why is this happening to me? And we ask it over and over and over again. I don't know if any of you remember this picture. This is a picture of my childhood friend. We grew up as next door neighbors. I had a sermon about him a year or so ago. And you might remember he, had, he was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And we had many conversations together. And every time I had an opportunity to go back to Texas, I would go and see him. And, you know, every time I saw him, he was a little worse and a little worse and a little worse and a little worse. And I'll be honest with you, I myself lived a bit in Bitterville regarding his situation. I was asking the question, why? And I know he was too. And, you know, the, the challenge was, and I think if maybe if I mentioned to you, um, Shortly after his diagnosis, within several months, uh, his wife divorced him. So, um, why? 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 Right? But if you remember, I shared with you something about his situation that he discovered the hidden benefit of his adversity. But it didn't come within a day. It didn't come within a week. It took months. In fact, I would suggest maybe even took him a couple years. He told me this. He told me, Rick, you know, if I believe that ALS saved my life. Now, he wasn't talking about his life here. He's talking about his life in eternity, which is really what really matters. I mean, last time I checked, nobody gets off the planet alive. Now, we know there's a couple examples in the Bible that talks about how Enoch walked with God and stuff, but I'm, t I'm thinking, statistically speaking, you know, of the billions of people who have lived before us, they have all had the same fate. Right? It's just the timing of what happens. But here's my thought. As Christians, as God followers, we have, we have a chance to have a different perspective on this whole thing. Because we know that life here is temporary at best. Look, you know, if you're over the age of 50, you understand that it went a lot faster than you thought it was going to go. And every 10 years goes even faster. And what I'm told by my mom, who's 90, she says it only speeds up. Okay? I mean, you realize that. Now, when you're 15, 20, 25, yeah, you can't comprehend that. You don't, you don't get it. It doesn't even register. You're, just, you're not even on that, you're, you're not in that mind space. But you know, if you're honest with yourself, it gets faster and faster and faster. So here's our situation. Where we are right now is temporary. This is our temporary home. This isn't home home. And so when my friend talks about things like this, I thought, you know, here he is. And he is at peace. He's at peace. Friends, when you're at peace, that's a classic description of one of the things that happens to us when we live in Betterville. Betterville is peaceful. And even when you are in a very difficult situation, you can actually be there. I knew this kid from when I was six years old. I mean, we did everything together. 
And when he tells me this, I believe him. Okay, so that's key number one. Key number two to live in Betterville when adversity strikes is stop complaining. Okay? Stop complaining. In Philippians 2.14, it says, Do all things without complaining and disputing. Now, I have to admit, I don't always live in Betterville. Oftentimes, I find myself living in Bitterville. Okay, but here's what I want us to, I, I would like to at least encourage you to think about. When we, and we'll go through key number three here in just a second, but when one of these pop up, maybe we, our prayer can be, Lord, when I'm not appreciating what I have, when I'm complaining, tell the, ask the Holy Spirit to tap me on the shoulder, knock me in the head something to give me the idea of like, look, this is what takes me to Bitterville, but I don't want to live in Bitterville. I want to live in Betterville, right? Okay, so I'll give you a, a, an example. Instead of whining about how bad you have been treated or how bad your life is, why not count your blessings? Okay, my tooth. So, about two months ago, I noticed I was having a problem with the molar that's right here on the top part of my mouth. And it was getting worse. Maybe it's three months ago. And it was getting worse. It was getting worse. So I thought, well, I don't really like going to the dentist, but I probably should go. So I went to the dentist. The dentist looks at it. She goes, I'm kind of concerned about that tooth. She goes, I really think, uh, I don't think it's going to be eligible to have a crown put on because it was splitting. The tooth was splitting. I think, you know, I think I would like to refer you to someone called, I think it's called a periodontist. Yeah, these are the people who do more extensive stuff. So I got to take a nice little trip up to uh, Midwest City, went to a periodontist and sit down and she looks at me and she's looking things over and she goes, Within just a couple minutes, she says, we're going to have to take that tooth out. Now, I can tell you that I didn't like that response. That wasn't the response I was looking for. And yet, I knew that she was right. But as I'm driving home, I'm not living in Bitterville. I'm not, I'm living in Bitterville, okay? I'm living in Bitterville, I'm living in Bitterville. Why is this happening to me? I, you know, I mean, I floss my teeth. My wife never flosses her teeth. She doesn't have any cavities. I don't mean that. I don't mean that in a bad way, Viv. I'm talking about not every day after every meal. That's what I meant. I didn't mean never. I hope you guys didn't get that right, okay? I'm just saying, I take care of my teeth so much better than my wife takes care of her teeth, okay? I'm just saying, I'm just saying, Vivian, is this true? Don't I brush my teeth? Don't I floss my teeth better? Don't you think so? Okay, but you see where I'm at? Here I am. I'm in Bitterville. I'm in trouble now. I'm in it. But here's the thing. In other words, why is this happening to me? I mean... Why is this happening, right? So, I mean, I'm just in this little circle. And believe it or not, I'm thinking about this as I am already know I'm planning on what I'm going to talk about here at church. I've been thinking about this for a couple months, okay, this talk. And I'm sitting here going like, why? I mean, why did I have to go down this path talking about Betterville and Bitterville? And then the Lord thought, well, Rick, let's give you a good illustration to use in your sermon. No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. But here's the thing. The thought is, is that I was bitter. So about three weeks ago, I went to the dentist down in Ardmore, and they took my tooth out. And as I was sitting there, and I'm going, you know, I'm glad I had a dentist that could do this for me. 
And I'm glad that this tooth now, it wasn't, it wasn't in good shape. They couldn't save it. She's told me, even when she took it out, she goes, you know what? I hardly ever see a tooth that splits down the middle just like this. She goes, do you want to see it? I go, no, I really don't want to see it. <laughs> even though that tooth had given me many happy years of enjoyment of eating and chewing and all these kind of things, I really just didn't want to see the tooth. I'm not, okay. But here's the thing. The thought is, is that I had a place to go for help. There was already starting to have a little pain at the top of that tooth. The pain is now gone. The lady who did the procedure was very nice. I felt like I was handled very uh, carefully, right? Do, you see what I'm saying? I mean, I, all of a sudden, my mind starts shifting to not complaining about the situation, but giving thanks for being able to have the ability to have this taken care of. And guess what? Just by that one small shift, it shifts me from what? Bitterville to Betterville. It's not complicated, but I find myself, can, I can get into this kind of stuck rut sometimes. And I just keep in this loop. And I think the Lord's saying, no, no, that's why there's really, you don't need to be complaining about this. You need to be giving thanks that you had the care to be given to you at the time you needed it. All right. Key three to live in better Bitterville, Betterville when adversity strikes. Okay, here we go. Forgiveness. I'll tell you. Th this one, well, let me just let me just share with you. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. Forgiveness. Here's a quote that I ran across as I was looking through this that I thought was really pretty amazing. Forgiving can be extremely beneficial for you. You know, think about the idea. I don't know. But think about this. Listen to this quote just for a second. When you hold resentment toward another, you are bound to that person or condition by an emotional link that is stronger than steel. Forgiveness is the only way to dissolve that link and get free. Now, I, I went back and I highlighted, the, I thought, what, what some of the real key things. When we hold resentment, we are bound. We are bound in a way that is stronger than steel. Imagine that for a second. Oh no, I can't forgive that person. Do you know what that person did to me? It doesn't mean you have to forget. I'm not saying you have to forget, okay? But the idea of when we harbor in our spirit an unforgiving mindset, it, it hurts us more than it hurts the person that we have that feeling towards. It's, it's, it's terrible. And get this, forgiveness is the only way to dissolve it and to get free. Before I move to Sonia's story, I wanna, I wanna just share with you one thought. I know some of you know me and you know this story. Some of you probably have never heard this story but it was about 20, twenty-six, twenty-seven years ago that I got a call. Well, I didn't get a call, but my boss calls me into the office and says, Rick, I want to let you know I got a call that your dad has died. And of course I said, do we know how it happened? We were told that he committed suicide. Okay? This whole forgiveness thing is tough. Okay? Because two things. One, the idea of forgiving myself for saying, 
what, how could this happen to your dad? Right? Why did this happen? My, I mean, you don't know my dad. You didn't know my dad. You didn't know my relationship, our family relationship with my dad, any of this kind of thing. But I can tell you this. You would have never in the wildest imagination think that my dad would ever do something like that. Okay? If you would have known. So, I'm thinking, why didn't you see this? My mom, why didn't I see this? My brother, why didn't I see this? My sister, why didn't we see this? You with me? So there's this aspect of forgiving ourselves. I mean, the idea of can we forgive ourselves for not intervening in a way that we should have, that we quote, would have intervened if we would have thought it would have gotten to this point. And I have, I've come to this point. But you know, I never realized how much harbor I had of the idea of being able to actually forgive my dad for doing this. You know, it's a hard, it's hard because you're sitting here and you're going, does he realize how much pain this caused my mom? Does he realize how much pain this caused his family? And then over time, I forgive him. I realized I don't totally know exactly what he was going through. Um, I didn't envision him ever being able to do this or making out that aspect. But the idea is forgiveness is very, very healing. And I don't know your situation, and I don't know who you're maybe having challenges with or who has caused you a lot of pain and a lot of grief and a lot of just junk in your life. Um, could have been from something way back many years ago. It could be something that happened to you a couple weeks ago. I don't know what it is for you. All I can say is that forgiveness literally can give you freedom. And freedom is one of the things that you, that leads to betterville. I want to share with you a little story about Sonia. I have it written down because I didn't want to lose anything. You might recognize this story as I go along. For someone who married at age 13, got divorced later on with two sons to raise single-handedly, juggled more than two jobs to make ends meet and had very little formal education just up to third grade, it would be very easy for anyone to believe that nothing good would come out of any parenting such as mother can give looking at these circumstances. Sonia was one of 24 siblings. Of her parents born in 1928 and she grew up in a foster homes until she met and married her 28-year-old husband at the age of 13. It's not painting a very rosy picture initially, is it? She stopped attending school after the third grade before she could learn how to read and write. When her sons were 10 and 8, Sonia made the painful decision of divorcing her husband, having discovered he had never divorced his first wife. Doesn't get much better, does it? Life became difficult for herself and her sons. Coupled with struggling with serious depression, she also had to work such long hours cleaning wealthy people's homes. Working two to three jobs at a time made it difficult to be with her children because she left early in the morning for work and often returned home when they were asleep. After realizing her sons were not doing well with their academics, especially with her young son bringing home test grades and report cards that confirmed his opinion of himself as being a dumb kid. She realized she had to do something to help her sons live up to their potentials. Praying to God for a wisdom on how to help them turn things around for her sons, she also paid attention to the habits of the high achievers that she worked for. She noticed that they read far more than they watched TV. Wanting her sons to be successful, she decided to start that practice with them. She devised a plan for her sons to curb TV, 
read two library books per week and write two reports on the books they've read. Sonia, their mother, took the reports her sons gave them, gave her every week, marked the reports with the check marks and highlighted as if she really had read through those reports. It was years later that the boys realized their mother could neither read nor write and that her marks were simply a trick. For her youngest son, who was always lagging behind academically, this regular reading habit turned his life around. He went from the bottom of his fifth grade class to the top of his sixth grade class in one and a half years. He earned a scholarship to Yale and became the head of the pediatric neurosurgery at John Hopkins Hospital when he was 33 years old. He was one of the youngest people to ever hold such a position and the first black person to have a position like that in the world, in the, in the world-renowned medical center. In the first seven years of his career, he performed breakthrough surgeries that changed the lives of his patients. And of course, we're talking about Ben Carson. Sonia Carson, the mother of Ben Carson. So what do you think? There was a time when she was living in Bitterville. And quite honestly, she had every right to live there. Did you hear her story? You paint a picture like that and you're going like, boy, there's just hardly any hope for something like that. But you know, small little changes about looking for what you actually do have in life and stop complaining and forgiveness actually can turn your life around. Three keys to live in Betterville when adversity strikes. Be grateful for what you do have in life. Stop complaining and forgiveness. Let's live in Betterville and let's only pass through Betterville. Look, I'm not here to tell you that you're not gonna feel bitter from time to time. And I'm not even here to tell you that that's wrong. But you know, when we live there, it deprives us of so many things that God would rather have us do. No one, understand, no one understands adversity more than Jesus. No one. I, pet, I shared, shared this last time, but I just, I find this so amazing. He healed the ones who arrested him. He served the one who betrayed him. And he loved the world who crucified him. That's our Jesus. This passage here, let's read it. I'm gonna just read it for you, Matthew 11. You've heard it before, but I just want you to think about this. I'm just gonna read the red part. You know this text. Come to me, let me teach you. You will find rest for your souls. Come to me, let me teach you. You will find rest for your souls. So no matter your hardship, no matter your setback, no matter your adversity, and no matter your problem, the key is come to Jesus. You just bow your heads as for closing prayer. Lord, we definitely um, can relate to having burdens. And just help us, remind us to lift them to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.